Good morning, church. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, last week, uh, we, of course, had Pentecost Sunday. We talked about, uh, we had a message geared around that. Uh, but uh, two weeks ago, we were in our, our series, The Church of Ephesus, in part 9. And uh, we're going to continue, uh, or today we'll be in part 9. We were in 8 last time. But we're going to continue in that series. And uh, we're going we're gonna to start with verse 14. So if you're watching this, of course, you can get turn to your Bibles if you'd like in Ephesians uh, 4, 4 uh, verse 14. But verse 15 starts with the word instead. And obviously that verse is a continuation of verse 14. You don't start a sentence with the word instead unless it's talking about something previous. And so I want to go back and read actually from starting with verse 11 to bring us up to date to where we're at. And uh, so we'll get into the flow and where we're going from there. So let's, uh, let's go to verse, uh, four, or chapter 4, verse uh, 11. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up, until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be an infants tossed back and forth by waves and blown here and there by the wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. You know, we quote this verse 15 so often, and, uh, but I want to I talk about it. I want to break it down a little bit more for a few moments and uh, I realize Paul is addressing the church and how we relate to one another and uh, how we relate within the church. But I, I do want to get into uh, talking uh, concerning non-believers for a moment. And, uh, and, and so we're, we're going to go that route. But I want to, uh, let me start by saying that uh, Jesus Christ is truth. And, uh, and we know as Christians, we know what, we believe the Bible is all truth and all Christians would say amen to that. And uh, we know John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through him. And uh, we also know that John 16, 13, that the Holy Spirit guides us into all truth. And so we also know from John 8, 44, though on the other end, uh, Satan is a liar. So there we have it. We have Jesus as truth, and we have Satan, the liar, right? And so these two come at each other, and they come at each other often in our society, and uh, but we, we, when I say that, and we can just say, well, that's it. We're all, we have all truth. We can go home now. But it's more than that. It's really more than that. Because here's what happens. Those who are speaking what they believe to be truth, and they're standing on their word, and they're strongly influenced. And, uh, you know, uh, and those people, they're strongly influenced by the liar. Uh, of course, we, we were using this as, as a representation of, of the enemy. And so they're over here. They're influenced by the enemy. But you've got... Uh, you know, the bottom line is, though, everything that they believe is not a lie, okay? So it's not outright lies. Sometimes they have truth, and, and their truth is, is uh, sometimes why they believe what they believe. They, they have some truth, but many times why they believe what they believe is because they've been emotionally wounded. And that woundedness floods into their emotions, and out of those emotions come forth their views and their beliefs. And so that's what we truth have in their life, I'm sure, but, but uh, they don't, you know, believe that, of course, Jesus is the only way and all those kind of things. Um, they're not all outright lies, but there is some truth to what they believe and why they believe their truth, right? And so many times what they believe is because of they might be coming out of woundedness or past experiences. And, uh, and so that woundedness, woundedness can flood their emotions. And uh, out, of the, out of those emotions uh, come forth, they come forth with different views than ours. They don't come forth with biblical views. They come forth with their own views and beliefs of, of how they see the world. They have a worldview that's different than Christians. And they have what they believe to be true. And, sadly to say, often or sometimes, I don't know if it's often, it could be, but it, there's many cases where their woundedness comes from well-meaning Christians or the church. Come on, you, am, I tell, am I saying it like it is? Bible-believing Christians in the church, and, and they get hurt, and then they don't come back to the house of God, and they get bitter, and they get hard, and they just they want to come at us. But really, there's a woundedness in there that's never been healed. And so it comes out in so many different forms. And it's funny, I wrote this all before, way before this whole, uh, the Minneapolis, you know, that whole police thing, all this happened before the George Floyd. This is all written before this. So I think it really applies in, in many ways. So, but um, as Christians, uh, we can't forget what 2 Corinthians 4, 7 states. It says this, uh, along with how we once thought it, and this is it, the God of this age 
has blinded the mind of unbelievers. So they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. When I first got saved in the car, I, I, now everybody's different. I had this, I asked God to forgive me my sin, come into my heart and life. I felt a lightness go over my body. I'm like, what was that? That was weird. I didn't see, but I had a carnal mind. I didn't even know what that was. Half hour down the road, I'm like, oh, I get it. My sins have been forgiven. See, I, in my, you know, when we're in our carnal mind, we looked there, and all of a sudden, everything started to look a little greener. The sky looked a little bluer. Everything became a little bit clearer after I got saved. I saw things differently. See, so we can't expect non-Christians to act like Christians. They're not going to. I didn't. I didn't act like a Christian back in the day. When I was at Central of Michigan, if you'd have saw me, you'd have said, oh, boy, that guy, he's hopeless, he's helpless, and he's he never going to come to Jesus. But I did because of the grace of God. Hallelujah. So we can't forget that. And so, um, but I, I know I saw so many things differently before I became a Christian than I do now. And if you're honest with yourself, you probably did too. And uh, so, but it's so easy to forget that now that we have come to truth. Do you like my big Bible? It's a holy Bible. Yeah, anyway. We, now that we've come to the truth, and, uh, but on the other side, we have those who know Christ as their Savior, and uh, they are strongly influenced uh, by the Holy Spirit, and they stand on God's promises, His truths. So that would be, of course, us. We stand on God's promises, and we say yes and amen to everything in the Word of God um, because we know that Jesus is our Savior, and He's our Lord, and He is truth, and that uh, we have all truth, and uh, we'll have nothing to do with, with the lies of the enemy. We'll have nothing to do with that. You know, we're going to separate ourselves from that. And so they don't want to hear anything that those over here have to say because, because they're ungodly, they're rebellious, they're God-haters, they're, they're our enemy. Well, really, quite frankly, church, they're not our enemy because everybody's been created in the image of God. God loves everybody. They're really not our enemy. <clears throat> Satan's our enemy, not other people. And so, so, but those over here don't want anything to do with these so-called Bible-thumping Christians, Right? They don't want anything to do with us. They call us all sorts of names. We're, we're homophobes, we're bigots, we're intolerant, we're haters, and the list goes on and on, and I'm sure you've heard it all. So this contention begins to build up between saved and unsaved. And, you know, I, I think back, and you know, it gets to, can be where both sides are yelling and screaming at each other uh, in the media, in the politics, and you know, social media. Now we've got that to deal with, and you know, people do that as well. And uh, it's gotten so divisive that on many college campuses, if you have a conservative viewpoint, you can't even speak. Now think of that. When Ivy League schools started, the only book they had was the Bible. That was what they taught from. Now you can't even have a Christian or a conservative speak on campus. How far have we gone in a, in a wrong direction away from God, right? So we have this going on, and, um, and so what happens is, this is what happens. You need truth! You've got to have truth, and if you don't get truth, I don't want to be a part of your world. You're just terrible, and I hate you. And so we just want to drill that stuff in them. But guess what, guys? If the Holy Spirit isn't there, you might as well not, you might as well not push all you. Because what does it do? It just pushes them farther and farther away, doesn't it? If we're going to, you've got to have truth, and I have truth, blah, blah, blah. And then they're like, I don't want your word. It's way old, and it doesn't apply to today, and I'm going to pick and shoot. I mean, they, they come back at us with all their stuff. And what do we have is, you know, this and that. We're constantly fighting each other, you know, and you need to be saved. And they're like, ah, you, you know, you're not walking. And they don't like us because we aren't walking in the truth. And they, they say we're not loving and all these kind of things. And it just goes on and on. So you have left, right, Jesus, Satan, truth, lies. What's the answer? What is the answer to all this division between the church and unbelieving world? It's easy. It's a four-letter word, L-O-V-E. And who's L-O-V-E? It's a three-letter word, G-O-D, right? God is love. 1 John 4, 16, and the, the apostle uh, John tells us that. And so it's not easy these days to walk in love when so much stuff's going on, though, is it? It's not easy. It's, so much stuff comes at us every day. And um, we often act outraged and, 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 you know, we act shocked when believers do sinful things and, and have the audacity, audacity to adhere to beliefs contrary to ours. How dare you could do this? This was a Christian nation. We were founded on Christian. That's true. But they, how could they have the audacity to do that? But I did it before I got saved. I was no different. See, sometimes we're so busy cursing the darkness that we're not doing what we were called to do, which is lifting up the light. We're really called to lift up the light. And uh, when we do that, things will get brighter and things will change. 
what is our ultimate goal as Christians? To, not to win an argument, to win a nation. And the nations of the world for Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to. The world doesn't want our truth when it's filled with finger pointing and pride and arrogance and hatred. They don't want our truth. All right, let's go on to vi- verse 15. Here we go. Well, I can find it here. Um, or 16, excuse me. From him, or no, I, I'm sorry, we're not there yet. Just a second, excuse me. Verse 15 doesn't say speak the truth or love. No, it says speak the truth in love. There's a big difference. Speak the truth in love. In the great love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, I bet you've all been to a wedding where you've seen the great love chapter and they talk about, you know, love is kind, love is, all those things, it's, you know the chapter. And, uh, but now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. We, we can't forget that. The greatest of those is love. Hallelujah. Love is an excellent thing. In fact, I'll go so far to say love is a very powerful thing. So is hate, but love is a very powerful thing in a good way. Because it's out of unconditional love that Jesus Christ came to the cross of Calvary for us. And if we love someone, we will uh, present the truth with it, won't we? And we'll do it in love. Truth is also an excellent thing. But it's crucial that we speak in love, not in a combative way. Because truth without love is contentious. It's combative. It's arrogance, really. It's self-righteousness. It's all those things. It only repels people and drives them further away. That's what happens. It just drives them away. Is any of this making sense? I know I'm spending a lot of time in this, but I just sense the Lord wanted me to go there when I was, when I was in, in fact, I didn't know what situation the country would be in when I, when I did this message, because uh, I'm about a month ahead right now, and so uh, it's perfect for today. It's actually perfect for today. Uh, but just a couple more things related to this, and we'll move on. Everything has become so black and white in our society, hasn't it? In that, I'm going to prove my point and my beliefs, and what you think or say doesn't matter. I think Jesus would listen. I saw Jesus listening a lot when he was on the earth. I think he would listen to people. We need to come back to some kind of civility and honest debate where we can hear each other out without belittling and degrading each other. That's what we need to do. Those with opposing viewpoints, we must be filled with compassion and understanding. After all, the last I checked, the Bible, God says, everyone's made in his image. Everyone. Everyone everyone. So I think as Christians, we've learned a lot. We've come a long way in how we approach. I mean, I'm just going to use abortion as an example. When we first, when abortion first became uh, on demand, or, you know, was able, to, people were able to have the abortion in Roe v. Wade in 1973, uh, you know, we, we wounded people early in the process, calling them baby killers and screaming at the abortionists and, uh, you know, and all those precious, confused, hurting women who were in a situation that they didn't know what to do. And, uh, and so, but, but things have changed, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. You know, now, you know, the, the thing was, that didn't draw people to Christ. That didn't draw people closer to the Word of God. That didn't draw people into our churches. Oh, these people hate. Yeah, I really want to go, you know, go see what Jesus is all about. He hates me, or he hates us. That didn't do anything. And uh, so they just, they stayed away. But today, we offer a different solution based out of love. I thank God for pregnancy resource centers. Why? Because they offer a woman, uh, they, they, they walk her through the decision. They show the baby inside her womb. That's what's so great about it. We couldn't do that in the beginning. But they show the ultrasound that offers uh, to stand by them through the process what they're going through this because they're in fear. They don't know what to do. And that's when we can come along and say, hey, we're, we're, we're there for you. And uh, many more babies are being saved today, praise God, and because of that and because of our prayers. And uh, keep on praying for that whole situation. Amen. So let's not condemn those. Let's come alongside them and say, come on, there's, there, this is, this, we'll be here for you. What can I do for you? We're praying for you. And, you know, and, and so there's better solutions. So, but anyway, let's bring it back to the church. This whole thinking of I have truth and you don't. You don't. It works its way into the house of God as well. Sadly, some, on the other side of the scale, some denominations and individuals have taken the love message too far to the exclusion of truth. So let's just love everybody where they're at. Our, uh, our attempts to maintain friendship and unity uh, must never, uh, the problem is it cannot cause us to contradict the principles in the Word of God. 
you can't do that. That's not true love. If I don't tell people the truth of God's word, I'm not really truly loving them, am I? Because they're gonna, if they don't get right with God, they're going to go to a place that's not going to be pretty. And I love them enough to tell them the truth. And so there's both sides of that, but we do it in love again. Because love without truth is not love. All it is is appeasement. Paul is expressing the importance of unity in the church. And he, how does that happen? Let's go to verse 16. Here we go. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each does its part. Paul makes a comparison between the natural body and the spiritual body of believers, the church. We need to have love and unity and love among brothers and sisters in Christ in order for there to be spiritual growth and for each individual to grow in God's grace. Hallelujah. If my arm is off in my physical body, my body's off. Yes, I can still function, but I can't function, if you will, at full force, can I? If, if, if somebody's not doing their part in the spiritual body, the spiritual body's not where it needs to be. Something is missing. So if you're, and I'll miss some of you, I know there's so many different ministries here, but if you're a worship leader, if you're a teacher, if you're a board member, if you're a, whatever, you're a greeter, it doesn't matter what you do. If, you, if your part's not being, if you're not doing God's part that he's called you to, then, then there's a weakness and something, the body's missing something. And we're all missing something. And so that's why just as our physical body needs the arm, and we know how that, we, the word talks about all that. I didn't get into all that, but in fact, I forgot this verse. I, I realized I even forgot to do this verse, so I kind of added some things in. But we all know the body needs every part to work and function. And so the spiritual body needs the same thing. So be in prayer about, well, God, what would you have me to do in the, in the body of Christ or outside in the, in the other ministries outside the church? All right, let's move on. So verses 13 through 15 or not 13 through 15, excuse me, in verse 13 through 15, I got so many verses here, Paul tells us how that is done, each one of us growing in maturity, stability, and integrity, amen, praise God. All right, let's go to verse 17, and and notice the title of this, Living as Children of Light. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking, amen. So, when converted Gentiles should not live like unconverted Gentiles. Christians should not look or, or live or look like non-Christians. Believers should act like believers, not unbelievers. Even though we live in the world, we're not of the world, right? And uh, we know that. And so we're not of it. That, but yes, does that mean we don't witness to people? That we don't, no, but we're just not of it. In other words, we don't take on their, their, their thinking, their, their behavior. We, we walk in a way that's pleasing to God. We walk in holiness and righteousness. Romans 121, speaking of the godless and the wicked, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Think about that. They claimed to be wise, but they became fools. The Greek word for futility means they cease to care. I don't really give a rip. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I'm going to do how I'm going to do it. I don't really care. We don't want to be in that spot, church, right? We don't want to be in that spot. And so uh, their hearts were hardened. And so it's important we live as children of light. Because here's the thing. The world is watching us. We're a representation of the world. They're watching us. If we claim Jesus and somehow they, even if they see us going off to church every Sunday morning, come back, they probably know they're probably Christians. Why do they get dressed up? They go to church and, or they leave the house at 9 o'clock. They come to, they're not stupid, church. Everybody else is sleeping in when they wake up. They're like, oh, these people are dressed up when they come out. What are, they, what are these people doing? You know, they're, where are they going? Oh, those are, I guess those are Christians. I don't, I don't know what that is, but... So now you're, you're, you're almost like in a fish tank, kind of like a pastor with a church. I'm in a fish tank, right? So I got to be careful of everything I do, and, and, and rightfully so. But we're in a fish tank. People are watching us. And so we got to be very careful how we carry ourselves with family, with neighbors, with coworkers. Uh, just be careful because they are watching you. And uh, so be that good witness, amen? Hallelujah. All right, 18 and 19. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Have, having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. Wow. See, these particular Gentiles were in sin and, and the, their futility led to emptiness with no purpose, darkened understanding, 
alienation from God, ignorance of God's ways, and ultimately a hardened heart. Do you ever notice that? Good things, you can have that upward spiral, bad things, or if you get in a bad spot, and you, it can get in a downward spiral. Has anybody ever been there? And one thing after the other, you just kind of keep going down. That's what, that's what in essence, can happen. And, and so we've got to be so careful uh, how we, how we you know, respond to that. So, um, but we see this, this progression of sin unfolding here. And, uh, but they sat in darkness, and they loved that rather than the light. And uh, through their ignorance, they were isolated from the life in God and his holiness. Not a good place to be. And their ignorance came out in their stubbornness. How many of you were stubborn before you got saved? Amen. <laughs> I'll have both hands up. And really, when you think about it, we are stubborn because why? We're not even accepting Jesus Christ. We won't even say, well, I need to humble myself. Yeah, I guess I'm a sinner. No, I can do this on my own. I'm stubborn. I'm going to do this on my own. I can do this all on my own. So, and what happens is their consciences become seared. In other words, they have no sense of their sin anymore and the danger of it and, and that it could cause them. They just start indulging in the sensual lust. And uh, when this decline occurs, uh, there's no bounds, there's no limits to their sin. It just keeps going and going. In other words, anything goes. That downward spiral just keeps going. So when you go to home today, if you want to do a little homework, we'll give you a little homework. See, like students, you haven't been to school, we'll give you a little homework. So read the rest of chapter 1 of Romans and uh, where I just left off, and you're going to see how destructive sin can be. It's going to be very destructive, and where it can lead you. You want to be aware of that, because it's a, it's a downward spiral. And the enemy, see, the enemy doesn't come in and go, hey, could, get a, it's like, what a gorgeous day. You, know, you get up, and you wake up, and you open the curtain. Hey, why don't you go commit adultery today? Uh, why don't you just go uh, steal and lie and cheat and you know, go, uh, go get another man's wife or go steal his car? That, that, that's not usually how it happens. It's this slow fade. The slow fade, you open the door for Satan, he'll, give it, he'll take a little more. Open the door a little more, he'll take a little more. So you give it, he'll take it. And so we don't want to do that. We want to stay true to the word and true to holiness and godliness. Amen? Hallelujah. Just remember, church, life without God eventually leads to frustration and useless efforts. Where we begin to do our own thing, mm, it's, it's not good. Causing us, it causes hardened of heart and us to be hardened of heart and not at all responsive to God. And we don't want to be, that, we don't want to be in that spot. 1 Timothy 4, 1, 2 says, The Spirit clearly says that in the latter times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits, things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars who consciences have been seared with a hot iron. Church is your pastor. My prayer is that none of those two verses would be any of us at any time. Hallelujah, would not reply. All right, let's go to verse 20 and 21. You, however, I like that. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. Those of you who have come to Christ have learned a whole lot of different things than what we just went over, right? We are saved from all that darkness, all the sin, all the stuff in the world, that others live in, and the weight that it puts us under. We're saved from that. We're free. We're light. We should be light. We're free from that sin. And the, no, the more we know about Christ, the more we are, I believe, to be required to live a life in a better way that reflects Jesus Christ. And especially because then they can see that we have experienced God's saving grace. If you think of Christianity, it's kind of like a classroom. Christ is the lesson plan, and Christ is the teacher, we follow the author of the lesson plan and the teacher daily who set the example by his life. The book is really his life. I mean, that was a, that's really the, you know, you look at the New Testament, the Gospels, that's his life lived out. Hallelujah. All right, 22. Let's start with there and go to 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your mind, minds and put on the new self to create it to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Wow, praise God. Thank you, Lord. Roman puts it another way in 6.6, 6, for we know that our old self was, some say old man in, in some of the versions, was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin. You know, when you think about it, we were slaves to sin before we came to Jesus Christ. We didn't know it. We thought we were free. We weren't free at all. We were slave to sin. Now we're slave to Jesus Christ. What a big difference. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 
So when the Bible states old man or old self, it has nothing to do with age. Maybe some of the younger people look at me and say, oh, they're talking about Pastor Ken. No, they're not talking about Pastor Ken here. They're talking about it has everything to do with a Christian before he came to Jesus Christ, before he was born again and restored to a right relationship with God. It's that person we were. I know mine wasn't pretty before then. And when we are going our own way and doing our own thing and apart from God, that's what that's talking about. One great way for me to keep myself from thinking I am better or holier than others is to look at my former way of life and be reminded that, you know what, I wasn't so great myself. Can I get a witness? And so it, doesn't, it keeps us from getting the long ecclesiastical noses and looking down on other people, right? Hallelujah. So if I'm really honest, I can even look at my life today at times and say, man, the attitude, man, the, the, some anger that rose up, the thoughts, some of the words I just said, or, uh, I go, ooh, not at all pleasing to God. Now, I know you're all holy and you're all doing everything right, but that's just me. I still have those things once in a while. And so pray for me, okay, because I know you guys are all right in the right spot. Totally never, I mean, perfect at this point. Okay, anyway. So the good news is that old man, that old self has been crucified, put to death with Christ on the cross so that a new and transformed life can come. Hallelujah. But that old man and that old self must continually be put off. That corrupt nature called man that is as old as Adam, and that's where it all started, to be quite frank with you. Whether you like it or not, or whether you agree with what I'm saying or not, we brought it, we brought it, into, we brought it into the world with us, and, and God's Word tells us that. We know that. I think the vast majority of people in the world, if they're really honest with themselves, would say, yeah, I'm a sinner. I know I've done wrong, and I've seen it out on the street when you got like Todd White and some of those guys witnessing on the street, and they'll ask him questions. Hey, have you ever lied? Have you ever stole? And I mean, sure, the people are like, well, yeah, yeah. So I mean, even the hardest of sinners will agree that they sin, and so they, we, we know we're sinners. We just don't know what to do with it, but that's where we come in and say, well, hey, uh, there's grace, there's hope, there's mercy, there's love, and you, you, can, you can come out of this. And so, but I think even many times the world knows that better, quite frankly, than Christians, because I think sometimes we get saved, and we're like, hey, I'm on the word and I don't need to do, I got all truth and I don't need, there's nothing in my life that I need. No, 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 no. We got to continually be examining our hearts, don't we, church? And making sure we're right before God. Trust me, it can go quick in a hurry. Stop reading your Bible for a day or a week. Stop praying for a day or a week. See where your spirit goes. See where your flesh goes, right? It gets worse. Uh, but it was no different in Jesus' day. Zacchaeus and the others, they knew they were sinners. And that's why Jesus went to them. He didn't, he, you know, he was, he was all about them because the Pharisees, Pharisees didn't think they were sinners. They were so good and they were so holy and righteous and all that stuff. The sin nature is in us and where we don't get a grip on it, it gets tighter and tighter a grip on us like that snake, snake wrapping itself around its prey. Like the trees in my backyard that I, in the woods behind me that I took out today. I have this some crazy vine that just grows up. It's white. It gets, it gets, and it just kills trees. It'll literally take oaks and bend them over. It just wraps itself around the Lord. The more we allow, allow Satan to wrap himself around us, the more he takes liberty and the more he takes life out of us. So we've got to be so careful. What we feed, what we feed on grows, what we starve dies. What we feed on grows, what we starve dies. So if I'm feeding on pornography, that's what's going to grow. If I'm feeding on alcohol, that's what's going to grow. If I say I'm not taking another drink, God help me, that's going to stop. If I say I'm not getting on the internet with pornography anymore, that's what stops. Because I've just starved the thing. Because the enemy will use that open door and he'll keep taking it further and further and further. I know I'm not getting many amens, but I'm preaching better than your amen and on to. So praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So we need to be made new in the attitude of our minds. If you think Satan throws up his arms and goes, ah, Another one's saved. Uh, Lily saved. Faith saved. Marissa saved. Eh, I'm done with them. I'm going after another person that's saved. Not at all. Not at all. He's going after everyone. He wants to get you back to your former self. He wants to get to back where you were, where you once were. Get back, Jojo. I don't know why that song, I thought just came to me that song, but he wants you to get back to where you once were. That's what he wants. He doesn't want you moving forward in God. Not at all. And so that's why we do everything we can to put off the old man. Get rid of it. Think of it this way. You took off the old clothes and you used to wear before you got saved and you put on new clothes, right? Right? You get rid of the old stuff and the ladies are all saying, Amen, hallelujah. And the guys are saying, I wore this 20 years ago. It doesn't have a hole in it. What's wrong with this? I like my old clothes. Just leave me. I'm good. I don't have to spend any money. I ain't going shopping. I, ah. Right? Am I right on that? Okay, maybe not. Yeah. Anyway, Colossians 3, 1 and 2 says this. What, it's, what it states is, Since then you have been raised with Christ... Set your hearts on things above 
where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. From the moment we get saved, we can't allow our former self, our former ways of living, to rule and control our lives or our bodies. Just as the old man is put off and the new man has to be put on, which was created to be like God in true righteousness and true holiness. When I mention holiness and righteousness, I'm not talking about some kind of religious ceremony, th ceremonial thing like the Jewish people had. No, instead we are to be united to Christ that we imitate the example he lived as our pattern for living. We adopt his values, his principles, and we obey his commands and strive to become more like him. So what do we do? We start loving people. We just kind of bring them back and talk to them and love on them, right? All right, let's cover one more verse and bring this in for a landing. Now, I don't know how many landings there'll be, but we're going to do it. All right, here we go. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Hallelujah. Praise God. One of these old man things we need to put off is lying. God seems to think telling the truth is very important. And I don't know about you, but I've noticed in our nation there's a whole lot of lying going on right now. And the truth, we, I always pray for, these are the things I pray for in church right now, truth and justiceness, justice and righteousness. If those things rise to the surface, the other stuff's got to start falling, doesn't it? Truth, justice, and righteousness, that's what we need in our nation. Praise God. After all, it's the ninth commandment. It made the list of the top ten. It's number nine, right? We should not lie, amen? Actually, I got that wrong there, I think. Anyway, it's one of the tens. I, I think it's, I may have it wrong on that. But anyhow, yeah, false testimony. Okay, so anyways, let's read um, Zechariah. And, um, and, and he gave this command to Moses in there, and this is what it says in uh, chapter 8. It says, In the eighth chapter of Zechariah, the Lord tells the Israelites, Just as I have determined to bring disaster upon you, and showed no pity when your fathers endangered me, says the Lord Almighty. So now I have determined to do good again to Jerusalem and Ju Judah. Do not be afraid. These are the things you are to do. Speak the truth to each other and render true and sound judgment in your courts. Do not lie, plot evil against your neighbor, and do not love to swear falsely. I hate all this, declares the Lord. I think it's pretty clear. Out of the six things the Lord hates in Proverbs, the seven, the seven that are detestable to him, two of the seven have to do with lying. Hmm, that's a big percent. Let me make it clear right here. God doesn't hate liars. He hates, those, he hates lying. Satan is the father of lies, as we said, and his lies to Eve ultimately led Adam to take the fruit, which put our world in, of course, the position it's in today. If God is so against lying, why do we all do it at some point in our lives? We think we can get away with it. We think we won't get caught. I think we've all lied to get out of trouble, right? When we were young, maybe when we were older, no, Mom and Dad, I didn't put the peas down the register or in the garbage. I didn't do that. I ate all my peas. Right? Something broke. I had four kids. Something broke. I didn't do it. All four. I didn't do it. Okay. So the glass vase jumped up, jumped off the shelf, and went smash. I just don't like being on this vase on the shelf anymore. I'm going to break myself. Right? Or we justify that it's a white lie. No such thing. No such thing, right? I'm gonna, I wasn't going to share this. I'm going to share this story. I think it just, and then we'll bring, I'm definitely going to close it. So, so Pastor Dennis was back when he was here, and he was in the Wednesdays a couple of times. He said, Everybody's, everybody in here is a liar. Everybody in here is a liar. I said to myself, what is he talking about? I don't lie. What is he talking about? I'm not, I don't sit there and go around lying. And stuff. I go, yeah, I guess I, I have exaggerated a little bit, and yes, that is a lie. And I have exaggerated a little bit. And, okay. So one day, it wasn't much after that. I'm, I'm going up to Mount, uh, t through Mount Pleasant to get somewhere to go call on people, and, and I've come up to the store west of town, and and uh, all of a sudden, it flooded my memory um, because at that store one time, we went to buy booze. And, uh, and so before I went in the store, I got to thinking, uh, you know, I thought about it. I go, yeah, nobody really carts me, uh, which is kind of funny. Nobody carts me. And so because now at that time, I had a beard here. I had hair. Like, I looked like Wild Ben. I was just a wild dude looking guy. And I made Pastor Paul look like uh, Lily of the Valley. I mean, your hair was nothing. Mine was just whoosh, you know. So anyway, so I was just a wild dude. But, I, but anyway, so... Uh, I said, yeah, I remember that. You know, when you, when you don't have confidence, I was thinking about it that day, they carted me, and I hardly ever got carted. Well, then the Lord said to me, yeah, you lied about it for two years. Ooh, because why did I lie? Because when I went to Central, I, the drinking age was 18. When I got to be 19, the drinking age changed to 21. 
And what did I do like everybody else? I took a pencil and I took the 59 that I was born and I, I raced the nine and just did the seven. It was good to go. They didn't have vertical, horizontal, nothing. You just race the number, put your own number in there and just show them. They go, okay, good. And you just buy your alcohol. But I hardly ever got carded anyway because of my beard and my hair. So the Lord said, you've been lying for two years. Ooh, ouch. So, you know, sometimes we think we're not doing things, but be careful lest you fall. And so I said, God, forgive me. That was a two-year lie right there. So anyway, Saul tried to play this game with God. The Lord told Saul through the prophet Samuel to attack the Amalekites and completely destroy everything, humans and, and the animals. But Saul spared the king, remember? And the best of the animals. And after the battle, when Samuel uh, catches up with Saul, Saul says, the Lord bless you, Samuel. Doesn't that sound good and religious? The Lord bless you, Samuel. I have carried out all the Lord's instruction. Oh, Saul, stop. Samuel replies, what then is the bleeding of sheep in my ears? And what is the lowing of cattle I hear? Ooh, that'll, that'll get you. He lied about it again later in the chapter. And of course, we know that his disobedience and his lying about it caused God uh, to reject him as king, didn't it? Wow, serious stuff, church. He didn't tell the whole truth. He had some partial truth. Yeah, you killed the other people and you killed a number of the animals. You didn't take the king's life, though, and some of these other animals. So that's a lie. And so, yes, we do lie when we exaggerate. And sometimes people think that it's profit, more profitable to lie than tell the hurtful truth. I don't agree. A lie is a lie. Just speak that truth in love. In any case, all these things are lies. And as Christians, we need to speak the truth because we owe that to each other. And so if we love one another, we will not deceive each other because lying can do great damage to people and dividing the body of Christ. I didn't plan on getting into lying on this message this deep either, but the Lord just kind of put that in there because, because you know, it's one of those sins we can just kind of go, eh, whatever, no big deal. It's, it is a big deal. So we have finished this mis- message on this verse about lying. And uh, that's one of the things that we take off when we take off those old clothes, when we take off the old man, the old stuff, we take off lying. That's part of the thing that we do. We take off lying. And so we come to Christ, we keep it off. We put off that old garment. And the opposite of lying is what? Truth, right? Jesus is truth. The only way we can put off that old man, of course, is to continue to put on the truth and trust in him. And so, so this is what I want to do. And so my question today to you is, and I'm going to ask everyone just to bow their head and close their eyes, and if you would, for a moment, do you know this truth today? Do you know this person whose truth, who walked the earth, his name is Jesus, son of God, son of man. Do you know him today? If not, you can know him today. Today could be your day. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. If you don't know him as your personal savior, which means he saved you from your sins and, and your Lord, which just means he's your leader, then you can do that today. And all I'm going to do, and I'm not going to embarrass anyone, I'm just going to throw it out there. And if you tell me, I'm going to ask you in a moment just to raise your hand. All that's going to mean is that if you don't know him, could you raise your hand and just say, that's me, Pastor, and I want to pray with you. And this congregation, those that are saved, will pray with you. We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to call you to the front, nothing. But we're just going to pray with you. And so if that would be you today and you say, you know, Pastor, I, I don't know Jesus as my personal savior, my personal the Lord, but I want to know him today. I want to walk in a new way today. If that's you, could you just gently lift up your hand, put it right back down, and let me know if that's you and say, yeah, Pastor, that's me. I, I would like you to pray for me today. All right, everybody, go ahead and lift up your head. That's great. Praise God. I'm going to assume everybody in here knows Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. So let me, make, let me pray, and then we'll get going. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for uh, this congregation, this church. I thank you for the visitors that are here today. I thank you for our people. Lord, I just pray a blessing on their day today, this week. I pray as they go forward, God, you bless them as they lie down, as they get up, as they walk along the road, as they're getting groceries at Meyer or wherever, as they're going to the gas station. Whatever they're doing, God, this week, may we all be just so aware of your presence uh, this week, God. May be, may be aware when you're saying, go speak to that one. Go smile at that one. Go talk to that one. Go just give a kind word. Maybe go pray for that one for healing. I don't know, Lord, but may we be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. People are open now because they're hurting. There's a void, and they're wondering about eternity because all that's going on in the world. We have the answer, and I pray your people will rise to the occasion this week and give the answer, myself included, God. Make us sensitive and not get so busy in our day that we forget that, hey, there's one, there's one, because Jesus left the 99 and went to get the one. And so, Lord, show us the one and let us minister the one. Bless your people, bring them home safely, and put a hedge of protection around them, I ask in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, amen.